welcome welcome hey becky <laughs> we're already laughing <laughs> i have the biggest grin on my face because i we we are a company um we have this incredible podcast and platform and we are so privileged to be able to bring in what we believe to be the most extraordinary humans the greatest innovators um, people who want to do good and sharpen us all. And we are talking to people uh, literally around the world in this platform. And all of a sudden today, someone that you could meet when you're six years old, who could be a lifelong friend, who is an extraordinary human, can come into your world and impart wisdom and joy and exceptional corporate responsibility and just show like that good humans are in positions of power and, and using it for good. So from playing in the sandbox to playing at the podcast today. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and I am just so privileged and just I'm so excited. I've been looking forward to this interview for months. And we are talking to Mike Beckham, who is the CEO and co-founder of Simple Modern. And you are going to fall in love with this company um, just in the way that we have, um, which is, I mean, this is a global brand and it's doing incredible things. But when you find out what is happening on the back end of this company. Um, it, it, it is the model that I just pray that entrepreneurs out there, people who are going into business and they want to be conscious uh, and, and consciously responsible about their impact on the world, it is the way to do it. And so, and this is a new, a fairly new company. Um, it's only been around for about five years, but we're really going to be diving into what Simple Modern is doing um, to do business differently, how they're involving their employees, how they are giving back, and how it is very much a thread of their value system. And so um, I want to read a little bit about my, Mike, and I promise I'm not going to share um, any of the embarrassing things from elementary school, middle school, high school, and on about him that I know he's <laughs> trepidatious that I will share. Um, so I'm going to keep it high level at this point. So Mike began his career working with the worldwide nonprofit Christian ministry crew. So I know that's familiar to a lot of people. I worked with them and too. then he, uh, oh yeah, John did. Yeah. I forgot about that. And John even went on a crew mission trip. So he has been um, transitioning to that business world after that. And he's been the part of founding several businesses. Um, that have cumulatively generated more than a billion dollars in revenue. And right now he is the CEO and co-founder of Simple Modern, and it has grown to be one of the leading suppliers of stainless steel insulated drinkware in the world. That was like a very buttoned up way to say, <laughs> people, if you want your the coffee cool cups hot. at Target, they're yeah. Simple Modern. That's oh the cool gosh, way to say it. Oh my gosh, they're at Target. They are yeah. everywhere. They're at Amazon. And I, I have to say, I'm backing off of the bio, I remember sitting down at a local Mexican restaurant with Mike years ago, Ted's Escondido, and him telling me about this company that he was about oh to launch gosh. and just feeling in that moment like something is going to happen. And I'm so happy for my friend. So um, and anyway, I will keep going because I'm already derailing and going off <laughs> on the deep end. This is what happens when you have people that you love on your podcast. But he's been married to his wife, Heather, for 17 years. Love you, Heather. Your wedding was beautiful. <laughs> and they have these two amazing kids. And I think the, per the personal and the family part is just as important to us as anything on the business side. And right now he's currently the senior entrepreneur in residence at the University of Oklahoma Price College That's of awesome. Business Entrepreneurship Program. Boomer. Did I embarrass you, my friend? Because welcome to the show. <laughs> well, I don't know if I can lead up, live up to that intro, but I'm really happy to be here. So proud of what you're doing with the podcast. Uh, I was really ecstatic when I saw that you were starting this. And just in general, like I love entrepreneurship kind of in all of its forms. And I think what you're doing here, stepping out and, and starting something from scratch and, and the way that people have responded to it, I mean, it's, it's a success story. It's an entrepreneurship success story. And so hopefully that's one of the things we can kind of talk about today is this overlap between what the nonprofit world seeks to accomplish and, and how that actually, I think, is complementary to the idea of entrepreneurship and how those two things can, can work hand in hand. So thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to be with you. Absolutely. And we are so bought into that idea. We just completed a big four part series on John and I's uh, podcast for Fridays that are the parallels between nonprofits and entrepreneurs and how we need to be leveraging these entrepreneurial ideas 
to further our mission. So I think the place I really want to start is just by hearing the simple modern story and how this came about and how these core values of taking care of people, being socially responsible, they were there from the very inception of this company. And I'd love for you to share that with our listeners. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give a little bit of my background. Uh, as you know, Becky, I was raised in Oklahoma City. You and I went went to school for years and years, and, and then I went to the University of uh, Oklahoma, and I majored in finance there. So uh, I, I had always been okay in school, but finance just really came naturally to me. And I thought almost immediately, like, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna end up doing something in finance. Um, two other really important things that happened in college. One was I, I met my wife, but the other was about halfway through college. So I was at, at OU on a, a scholarship that would pay for five years. And in typical lazy college student fashion, I took every last day of those five years to get my degree. If you, if you kind of <laughs> saw it right down the middle, uh, this huge life event happened of me becoming a Christian. And so I had these very different halves of college. But in a lot of ways, a lot of the way that I think, my worldview, things that have happened since then go back to that, that decision and that change in worldview. So when I, when I go to graduate, my wife and I are engaged at that point, and she has another year. She's getting a, a master's degree in accounting, uh, and I, I make the joke that in five years, she got two degrees, and I got one. But uh, <laughs> she had another year, and so somebody challenged me, like, hey, would you be open to doing a year of, of ministry while, while your wife finishes her master's. And I thought, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm open to that. I'll do a year in, in the ministry world and then I'll go and I'll, I'll work in finance. And, um, and one year turned into two and turned into nine, basically. And I, I just loved it. I loved uh, that my job was really investing in and pouring into other people. It was so much of a better fit than I could have even anticipated from the outside. So uh, I was doing that. I got to be 30 and I thought, well, you know, all those thoughts that you had about, you know, someday starting a foundation and working in finance or teaching in finance, you know, like, those are obviously not going to happen. Nobody is beating down, your, you know, the door of a 30 year old who's, who's been working in ministry to, uh, to do any of those things. Uh, but my brother had been, who's my brother's a couple of years younger than me. Uh, he had been working in, in marketing. He had kind of his own business in marketing, but he really wanted to start a company. And he said, hey, would you be willing to help me, me do this? And I said, okay, well, I, I love it as a side project. And so I helped him recruit the, the kind of founding team for uh, what was an online auction business. And we started that in uh, October of 2009. And that thing just grew like a, you know, it just took off like a bottle rocket. Uh, I was the oldest person associated with the company. I was 30. So it was very much like inmates running the asylum kind of situation, <laughs> uh, kind of like all the stereotypes that you might see in like a, a commercial or a movie. Um, and so I, I got to about 2012. We, we had just had my son, who's, who's nine now. And I just felt like I was riding two horses. You know, I was, I was working a full-time job doing doing ministry. I was working really a full-time job helping run this really high growth internet company. And I just felt like I couldn't be the, the person that I wanted to be and do all these things well. So I ultimately felt like the, the call was to move from nonprofit into the for-profit world. Um, and, and so I did that in 2012. Spent several years working with my brother. We launched um, several subsequent businesses. And honestly, Several of them did not go very well. I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I talked uh, a little bit in a recent blog post about, about some of the reasons that I think that happened, but learned a ton during that period. Learned uh, more about what I thought culture should be and, and what uh, the kind of company that, that I would want to run. And, and then in 2015, uh, a couple of people that I'd known all the way back to their college days, I, I'd met them as students when I was in ministry, approached me and said, hey, would you be interested in doing something with us? It's kind of a side business. And so uh, I, I said, yes. And that ended up growing into the thing that is Simple Modern. So we, we decided, we early on, we said, we want to focus on e-commerce. We're really, we have this competence in e-commerce. And so we want to do something that's e-commerce first. And we want to just do amazing quality products. And we want the company to be built on generosity. And that's about all that we knew. We started generating like 
ideas of what, what are the different things we could sell. And the, that list exists somewhere. I, I pulled it up not too long ago. And it is like a graveyard of terrible ideas. Like there are so <laughs> many bad ideas on that list. Uh, and, you know, I wonder, like, what, what would my life look like now if instead of, you know, selling drinkware, we sold pet gates or, you know, whatever else, compost <laughs> bins, whatever else we had on this list. But one of the ideas was insulated drinkware. And this was right around when kind of Yeti with the Yeti tumbler was becoming really big. And I think in general, just it was breaking into the mainstream. So uh, that was in 2000. We, we did our first, we had our first sale. And uh, March of 2016, and, and the company has really just kind of grown like a weed uh, since then. We've been we've been fortunate to have a great team and uh, a great product, but we've also had a lot of things kind of break our way. So, uh, in general, uh, at this point, where we're at, we have 50 employees, uh, and we sell about seven million bottles, tumblers, that kind of stuff a year, seven million units a year. Um, and you can find our products at Target, Amazon, Sam's Club, our website. There's a couple of other major partners that we're, we're talking to and we're still trying to figure out, um, you know, in a post COVID world, what, what's best. But anyway, so it, it's been a pretty amazing run up until this point. Well, I can say, yeah, we are fans of you as a person, but we also love your products as I'm drinking out of my simple modern I know, I'm holding here. mine up as if They're people like can see boys. me. <laughs> and I will yeah. say that they drink out of those every day. We literally <laughs> so do. Yeah, is. we literally do. So go get some simple modern while you're at it. Um, okay, Mike, I love talking to founders. I love talking to CEOs because so much of the culture you create starts within yourself as a leader. And so I love if you kind of talk through what are some of your core values and how has that played out in how your organizational culture looks today with Simple Mind? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question, John. I, I think that one of the reasons why I mentioned, you know, becoming a Christian is because that was really formative in thinking about core values. And then I think on top of that, I just have some natural kind of bends towards certain things. Uh, some of the things that, that I really value are, I really value growth personally. I really value learning um, and, and trying to push myself. You know, one of the things that, a, a lot of these end up flowing into what our company values. Um, so like our company has five core values, excellence, generosity, growth mindset, collaboration, and humility. Those are all examples of like, for me, uh, core values and, and maybe with humility, more of an aspirational value. But the the idea that I want to be somebody who really uses the time I have to, to push myself and, and do the most that I can, but not with the goal of, you know, having a bigger, you know, a bigger house or a bigger bank account, but being able to make more impact on, on the lives of other people. So, uh the values that I have end up being a huge part of the foundation of how we thought about building the, the team at Simple Modern. And one of the things I shared, uh, I shared with others is that in order to make sure that, that really we did have value alignment, uh, I really tried to hire uh, both with the co-founders that I, I chose to go into business with and then the subsequent people that we hired, we really placed an extremely high emphasis on value alignment. Mm -hmm. um, my, my point of view is that skills can be taught and you know a lot of e-commerce can be taught you don't necessarily have to have experience with it um, but value alignment can't be taught and so we we try to think about the organization in terms of we want to be homogeneous in terms of values and we want to be heterogeneous in terms of approach and background and you know and everything else so you want you want diversity in terms of all the different ways that people approach things and the type of people you have and the personalities and all of that stuff, but you have to have unity on the core values or ultimately the, the whole thing doesn't, doesn't work. So uh, I, I think that the, the generosity idea though, if I had to kind of narrow down one thing, I would say generosity tends to be a life theme for me. And, and another life theme, when I turned 40, my wife held a, a a surprise birthday party for me and she she really got me like I, I did not know it was coming um and at it she had a whole bunch of people basically give speeches about how they felt like you know what they saw in my life and how they felt like I had impacted them and one of the things that was the most affirming is that several people said I feel like you have believed in me more than I've believed in myself at points and so I think that's probably another thing that I really highly value is uh, affirming and empowering other people. 
Uh, and that's, that showed up, not just in the company stuff that I've worked on, but also it's part of the reason why I'm in, doing teaching in addition to a pretty full plate is that I, I want to be one of those voices in the lives of younger people saying, hey, you really can do this. You know, I know you have self-doubt. I know it seems intimidating, but you really can do this. Um, so anyway, those are some of, some of my core values. Uh, I mean, there's a ton. Really, if you think about it, the number of things we value, there's a ton of them. But there, those are a few that I really have specific emphasis on. Well, you're preaching to the choir, especially Julie right now, who I'm sure is just nodding furiously. Yeah, because, I look like a bobblehead over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, because we talk so often, Julie always brings up and reminds us of the young professional. And we always want the young professional to feel seen. And all of us were the young professional at one time. And we were all fighting through imposter syndrome and am I doing am I doing this correctly and and there's so much going on as as you're trying to figure out who you are in business while still staying true to the things that are important to you and your own values so I love that you've done this and and I I want to make sure that I'm saying your mission statement correctly because we geeked out about it as a company <laughs> is we just we just rewrote it so I, I don't know if you have the new one or the old one we saw a really cool quippy video on linkedin it's like really incredible ago. we're going to put that video actually yeah, in awesome. the show notes because we want other people to see it because it's probably a two minute glimpse into who simple modern is and it has so little to do actually with the product and has so that's what i observed and so much more to do with who they are as people and what they represent and who they are living for. But the mission said, it's this, this is a corporate for-profit. We exist to give generously. That's it. We exist to give generously. And when we saw that, we thought that should be everybody's mission statement in this lifetime. All of us should exist to give generously. So I just think about having that be such a tone setting statement for what happens when you interface with your company. And I want to talk about the impact of that, but, and, and please correct anything that, that I misspeak and say about the company, but I believe you guys are giving 10% of your net proceeds back and you have identified four, four or five of these key areas and, and things that you want to pour into. You don't just want to pour into them. You want to help eradicate them. Water scarcity, human trafficking, these kinds of things. Can you talk a little bit about why those were selected and what you are doing to impact those sectors? Yeah, absolutely. So a little bit of the background, giving is really a foundational part of our company culture. Uh, as I mentioned, when I left the nonprofit world to begin, become an entrepreneur, it's because I thought I could make more of an impact through giving than just my time alone in the nonprofit world. And so generosity has been really a central value since my first day in, in the business world. Um, and it's really been a, a central part of our business. So um, some of the ways that that shows up, one of them is the obvious that we, we are committed as a company to giving 10% of our profits away to charitable causes. On a more personal level, like my personal goal is that 90 something percent, you know, of the, the profits that come from this company are going to be given away. Uh, you know, I don't have this aspiration to, you know, just grow this huge snowball of money that, that I don't need. And so, uh, hopefully on a personal level, there's even a higher commitment than that. And I, I know that that's shared uh, by other, other owners of the company. Um, but one of the things that I think was really impactful in my life is working in the nonprofit world as the very first job I really worked out of college. And so like one of the things I'll, I'll kind of liken it to is with a puppy in the first few months of a puppy's life, whatever experience it has, has a disproportional impact on the way it reacts for the rest of its life. It's called the imprinting period. And I think working in the nonprofit world had this kind of imprinting impact on me where my wife and I, I mean, like I made like $18,000 my first year out of college. And so like, we, were, we were incredibly happy and we, we really, I, I think, ratified this perspective of like, our life's not going to be about getting stuff. That's not, that's not what our marriage is about and that's not going to make us happy. And so then later on, when my circumstances changed, that was still the foundation that, that I was kind of building off of. And so um, the organization that, you know, is built on this idea of we want to be generous. And, and in a lot of ways, I think capitalism as a whole is kind of on trial in our society. 
Like if you look at younger demographics, there's more and more of this kind of negative perspective on capitalism, even though capitalism has produced all kinds of incredible things and has lifted you know, millions, billions of people out of poverty, there's, there's a little bit of a negative perspective. And I think that some of that comes from the explosion of income inequality and this perspective of capitalists as people who are just trying to hoard. And so I do think the next generation of great companies that you're going to see are going to be different. I think they will be companies where they're intentional about the goal here is not to hoard resources. The goal is to you know, impact the world in a positive way and to make people's lives better. Uh, and that's, that's what we want to be true. Uh, we hope we're a part uh, of that next batch of companies. So we, we take a pretty holistic view when we think about generosity. Um, so yeah, it's giving your money, but it's also how do we price our products? I mean, you, you guys have seen this, our products are as good as any, you know, anyone in our category. I mean, if you look at reviews online and things like that, you can make a really good argument that we have the very best quality products in our entire category. We do not price it. Uh, we don't price it that way. We don't price it the way that some of our competitors price it, but that's a conscious decision. It's, it's an idea of generosity isn't just, you know, giving, giving to charitable causes. It's also how are you generous with your customer and your interactions with them and the way you price your products? How are you generous with the team that you work with? So like one example is we try to build a lot of time in where we're pouring into our team and we're doing a lot of like career development and perspective development, culture development. And so like, you know, that's, that eats up hours out of the week, but we think it's a great investment because it's an opportunity to be generous. One, one of the, even the most simple ways that, that we talk about it is, if you think about it, affirmation is free, but we can be so stingy with it sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's one of the easiest ways to be generous in our lives. So the, the big idea I'd kind of try and highlight is that we don't want to get pigeonholed into just thinking generosity is when you give money away to a charity. That is certainly an important facet of it, but it's part of a bigger picture of do you have this attitude of, hey, everything I have, I, I want to be open-handed with for the benefit of other people. And I think when you take that, you start to see all these ways that it, it can bleed into different parts of your life. So to, to give you a little bit of specifics about like the actual you know, nuts and bolts of what we've done, uh, I think that the organization had uh, you know, a real defining moment in March of last year. I mean, gosh, we all did in some ways, right? So you, as a leader, there's kind of you saying, here are our values, here's what we're about. And then there's the reality. And sometimes you hope that they're the same. But often they're not. You know, like one of the famous examples is that, like in in Enron's uh, foyer their, the, of their their headquarters, they had their company values and like integrity and honesty. You know, things that were obviously not really valued at that organization. So I felt like the litmus test for us. Uh, one of the litmus tests was this past March. We uh, when we hit COVID and and the kind of the lockdowns. Our company was growing, depending on the sales channel, you know, somewhere between 40 and 100% year over year. Oh my gosh. And then, <laughs> so happy yeah, I mean, it's, it's really been insane. Uh, the growth we've experienced, and literally in like a three week period, we go from that kind of growth to being down 60, 70% year over year. Literally, like Amazon was so overwhelmed with orders that they, they took the shipping timeline on any of our stuff. And, and said, it's a month and a half from now, it's in May. Like you order, and so people, they, they didn't want people ordering our product. Target literally said, we cannot take in any shipments of your product for the next couple months because we've got to use all of our capacity for essential goods. And so, you know, our numbers just kind of drop off a cliff. Yet our executive team were having these conversations about like, hey, you know, what are we going to do? How bad can this get? Are we going to need to take pay cuts? You know, like, how are we going to get through this? At the same time, though, you have more people losing their job, right? And you have more need than uh, any period I can remember in, in the, the last 10 years. And so we really felt like, man, if we're really about generosity and helping people when there's a real need, like now's the time. And so uh, we, we leaned in, you know, we leaned into generosity at the same moment that our business prospects were the most kind of uncertain. 
So a couple of things we did. One is we did what we called the Bottles for Heroes campaign, where we sent over a million dollars in bottles to frontline workers in areas that were really being heavily hit by, by COVID, um, where the hospitals were filling up and that kind of stuff. And then we also did like a 40 days of giving where every day we gave $1,000 uh, to an organization that we felt like was doing you know, something significant in, in charitable work. And I, I just felt like it was a revealing moment that it was us kind of really putting the flag in the ground and saying, we're not just going to say we value generosity, but at the point when it's the hardest to actually lean in and be open-handed, we're going to, we're going to do that. So uh, on, a, on a larger scale, uh, every, every year we are giving 10% uh, of, of kind of our profits away. And so uh, this last year we were able to give away 400,000 in cash donations and then the million dollars in products that I mentioned. And as you mentioned, Becky, we, we focus on marginalized communities, clean drinking water, education, ending human trafficking. You know, there's so many other great causes uh, that uh, maybe on a personal level, I, I'd love to be involved in, but we, we wanted to kind of keep some kind of a focus on a company level. So we felt like we could really move the ball on a few areas. Um, and, and one of the best parts is we've been able to work with some really outstanding locally based uh, charities. A couple that are worth highlighting that I know all of you are, are familiar with would be Water 4 and Restore OKC. Mm -hmm. So Water 4 is, is really working to, to end the clean drinking water crisis that's impacting still 50% of the world. Thank you for not. name dropping our favorite charity. We appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're doing fantastic work. And you know their model is really this idea of you go in and you build a well, but the well becomes a business. You know, when we talk about how capitalism and entrepreneurship and, and nonprofit can blend together. What's interesting is if you just build a well and give it to people, they won't maintain it. Right. They won't take care of it. But the moment you start to charge anything for water, even if it's a very small amount, they start to value it uh, and it creates entrepreneurship, it creates income streams. There's all kinds of you know these, these kind of uh, halo benefits that you get from that. Uh, one of the stories that, that I saw recently um, they, there was this, this woman named Petronella. They were telling her story and how she had seven kids. One of them had died basically from, from dysentery. And she was having to walk, you know, several, several miles uh, every day to get, to get water at the local river. There are crocodiles in the river. I mean, if you can imagine this woman, she's got a child sling to her. She's, you know, she's making this huge trek to get all this water and you know, you're trying to navigate crocodiles. And then when you get the water home, it's, it's not safe for you to drink. So how amazing is it that we can sell a water bottle and impact somebody's life we haven't met in such a positive way, right? And this is, this is one of like the, the more mind blowing kind of things for me uh, is, is the way that the things that we do can impact people that we'll never meet, but in incredibly significant ways. Walmart has this thing that they do with their buyers. So buyers are constantly negotiating. This is a Walmart thing, right? They always negotiate for the, they're notorious almost for how they negotiate for lower costs. And the other side of that is when they train their buyers, they tell them, you need to pretend like the person who you're negotiating on behalf for is there. That all of your millions of customers that are gonna buy at this price, that's who you represent when you're in these negotiations. That's your motivation is you're fighting for them and you're fighting for lower prices for them. And it's a really powerful thing, right? When you know like, hey, I'm doing my job to fight for all these unseen people. And we talk a lot about that with our team that you know, when we do our job well, we are, we are working for all these unseen people that we get to serve through, through different uh, giving. The other uh, local organization that's worth calling out was Forum KC, who works with marginalized people groups in the Oklahoma City community. Uh, that's been a huge, you know, it, it's just been a huge national issue really over the last, the, the last year. Um, they do amazing work in a number of different ways. They have reading programs and, and things in schools. My mother's been a, a volunteer and has, has loved being a part of that. We uh, helped fund a greenhouse where it, it basically produces vegetables and healthy food in an area of Oklahoma City that's a food desert. And so they actually have interns that are employed from the, you know, people from the local community that get to be employed at the greenhouse. They sell the, they sell the produce. 
people are actually have access to, to healthy food. It's, it's just a really cool model. Um, so many cool things that they're doing. So uh, anyway, those are a couple of people that we work with. And then the other really cool thing that's worth, worth mentioning is that we take a portion of our giving budget and we just tell each of our employees, hey, this is yours. Give it wherever you think it would be. You know, stay away from highly political things, but give it wherever you think it can be uh, the most helpful. And so in the upcoming year, several of our employees, I mean, like our, our average employee is going to get thousands of dollars to direct to uh, a charity of, of their of their choice, which I think is is awesome. So we really believe in this idea of stewardship and empowering people. Uh, and, you know, even though we're kind of at the beginning of the journey, our company, as our company continues to, to grow, the profitability is growing and our, our potential for impact is growing. I've just been so encouraged by what we've seen so far. When does Mike have time to be a CEO? <laughs> I'm not hey, kidding. Like We're going to talk about this later. Because you're but, being like chief but, humanitarian. But honestly, like when you get to this yeah. point and you have a team as amazing as the team that I get to work with, it's it's just really remarkable how much, how unneeded I am at times, you know, because I just, there's this amazing group of people that have bought in to the mission and vision and what we're about and have been empowered and have been coached and entrusted and, and are doing amazing, right? For the first time in five years, I really feel like, hey, if I just kind of totally take my hands off the wheel, <laughs> like all the balls aren't going to drop, you know, like my team probably wouldn't want me to do that, but like... <laughs> Things are going to be okay, and and it's a it's been a pretty amazing experience. I just think about the juxtaposition of a simple modern with an Enron, and I and I watch the smartest guys in the room. I remember that documentary, crystal clearly, and and the vision that I have are the people walking out of that building with boxes, you know, of their things. And walking into my mind, walking under that integrity is is who we are, and just the irony of that. Don't do that, people. <laughs> Please yeah. do this, because I can just see that everything that flows from this is going to be so uplifting to not only the nonprofit that it benefits, the end user of that mission, to the employee that either is giving these gifts or is on the front lines of serving. And I have to say, I don't even know that you've talked about that, but I know that your employees are hugely involved in community service and being a part of the mission, not just giving to it. So anyway, I just think it's wonderful. <laughs> I mean, Mike, there is, I want people to like listen back to that 10 or 15 minutes that you shared that because if you're in the social entrepreneur space or if you're on the nonprofit side, this is leadership today in an organization. And I'm sorry, people are going to get tired of me talking about this book, but Simon Sinek's The Infinite Game. This is where we're at. I mean, we have to be capitalism 2.0, where it's not, we're just providing value to the top of the top. We're creating value at other levels and we exist to impact and we exist to help society and lift society. And you've clearly done that throughout the culture of your organization. So I think um, just kudos for leaning in on that. And I'm sure it's hard sometimes to make those decisions, but these values have really kept you guys grounded and clearly are making such a huge impact. So just applaud you guys for, for all of that. Um, I wonder, you know, there's so many fundraisers that are listening to this podcast or nonprofit purists um, that would die to partner with an organization that's as philanthropically minded and generosity minded as you all. Um, I would love for you to kind of talk about, you know, what kind of corporate partnerships do you like? And I, I don't want to steal your answer, but some of the trends that we're hearing is that it's not about buying a table sponsorship, you know, anymore, obviously. It's about these bigger ideas that hook into values. And so I would love for you to kind of talk about that and through the lens of how y'all decide where to give back. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. So I'll, I'll give kind of a mental model here. Fundamentally, the way that I think about things is I am always looking for people that are good stewards and that really at the, the position I'm at in life, what, what my purpose is, is to entrust, encourage, empower good stewards and let them do their thing. And so there are, there are good stewards in the business world, there's good stewards in the nonprofit world, but that's really what I look for. Um, you know, I'm, I, like you said, I'm not necessarily wanting to buy a table, I'm happy to do it, you know, if that's the mechanism that you want me to do it. I'm not about, you know, it's not about getting our, our logo on a t-shirt 
It really is about finding people that are in the nonprofit world that I feel like are making a difference and are good stewards and saying, here, take, take this money and invest it, you know, to the best of your ability. And, and I try and really do the same thing on the business side. You know, really, I think what's made us successful as a company is that we hire people that are good stewards. And so when I say, like, I really don't freak out if I, if I kind of, you know, take a few hours and I'm not thinking about the business, it's because I know it's in the hands of really, really good stewards. So one of the things that I think is true about both Restore OKC and Water4 and several of the other, I mean, all the charities really that we're working with is that there is this track record of people that are really amazing stewards. And when you give them resources, they're creative and they're, and they're thoughtful and they, they're able to make an impact with it. And so I, I think it starts with, especially when you run a business, you're going to be results oriented. Like there is going to be a results orientation. I think in the nonprofit world, it doesn't really translate perfectly. I mean, I definitely learned this in the ministry world that you can't, everything can't be about numbers, right? But there should be indicators that you're, you're a good steward and that when resources are entrusted, you, you do a good job. I think that will naturally lead to capital finding its way to your door. Like one of the realities is that and I feel this at this point in my life, for sure. Uh, it is it is not appealing to just write mega checks to people that I don't know, you know, like, and so finding, I think the, one of the problems I feel like I'm, I'm going to face is, as the company goes on is continuing to find uh, enough opportunities where I have a direct personal connection that I want, that, that, that I, I want to give to, and where I know the track record of the, the people that I'm investing in. So, uh, I would say, you know, it starts with when you run a culture with your nonprofit that's similar to a for-profit, you work hard, you're excellence driven, you're, you're trying to be a good steward, you're, um, you're trying to, to drive results, improving the lives of other people, that it naturally compounds over time. Um, and, and, you know, listen, the nonprofit world, you guys know this and I know this, like sometimes it does an exceptional, there are some exceptional people they do exceptional things. And there's other times where it's like people that are on cruise control. And the weird thing is that you, you have both, right? Like uh, one of the things that I've read is that, you know, sociopaths are incredibly attracted to the nonprofit world because they can hide in it because it's assumed nice. that you have good intentions. Wow. Uh, so obviously most nonprofit people don't fit that profile, but I just say that to say that I think when you have the right mindset people that are wanting to give to nonprofits will naturally gravitate towards you. One of the things that, the two things that I learned when I was on the raising side, one is you have to tell stories and cast vision. It's not enough to say generally, you know, hey, we, we helped 10,000 people in Africa get clean drinking water this year. You have to be able to say, here is Patronella. Here is her life. Can you relate? Can you relate with trying to keep six kids alive you know, while you're also working and you're dealing with crocodiles, you're going to like, you know, you have to make it personal for people. And so I would really, when, when I was in the ministry world, one of the things we did with our donors is we sent them a the kind of a newsletter update that kind of dates me, uh, that we sent a paper in the mail <laughs> newsletter. Uh, but what I found too, over time <laughs> is that the most effective thing was to literally just have somebody that was impacted by the ministry just write their experience and just send that out. Like I didn't need to write a bunch of stories or, you know, or tell people the great things that were happening. It was just literally like, Hey, in the words of a person that's impacted here, here's an example of how you're making a difference. Um, so I think that's one thing is that we've got to tell stories and we should invest the time and the effort in becoming really good storytellers. Mm -hmm. The other thing is you, you have to cast vision for people. You know, people desperately want vision. There's a great quote. If you want people to build ships, you don't talk to them about the gathering of wood and hammering of nails. You talk to them about the sea. And this is the essence of what we need to do in the nonprofit world and even in the for-profit world. We've got to talk to something deeper in people about aspirationally what they want to be true about their lives and what they want to be true about the world. And when we do, they connect with that in a really powerful way. So th that would be my encouragement to all the people out there that are in, in fundraising roles. And I would just say it is hard, right? 
Fundraising is difficult. A lot of my motivation for being in the for-profit world is to be one of the people that makes your job easier because I know how hard it is. Um, but know this, there are so many people like me out there that love investing in what you're doing um, and, and uncovering them to, and developing those relationships does take time, uh, but it's worth it. And yeah, so that, that's probably what I would say to the fundraisers. We need Mike in his spare time to create some kind of a consortium of companies <laughs> that are like this, because Seriously. I really do think there is something to the conscious consumer, because there are so many of us out who want to be conscious consumers. We want to know that what we're buying actually has an in-purpose. I mean, how, how good does that make you feel, Julie, when you buy that simple mon- She Julie just went to Target and bought her simple modern sure water bottle. And it's like, how good does that make you feel? to know that 10% of what you just poured into this product at, at Target is going to help a Petronella, you know, in Mamumba Island, you know, mm-hmm. over in Africa. And I just think what Mike has said here is something that we get on our soapbox and preach about all the time, which is the power of storytelling and being able to talk about, we've been talking about Petronella a lot on this, I'm going to keep going with it, but it's like to hear her story, it's one thing to say, there are people that don't have clean drinking water in Africa, you know, but to say, here's a woman, here's how many children she has, put it, put her on a video, because I have seen her video, and let her talk, Mm -hmm. and let her look into her eyes, and see what she looks like, and Water 4 has an incredible video, we can probably find it and put it in the show notes of this, because you see her before, and then they go back and talk to her afterward. And the look in her eyes and the vibrancy that she has after she has that well, to me as a mother, that speaks to me so directly. And it makes what we want to happen in this lifetime. I want to get on board. I want, I want my gifts to help thousands of Petronellas. And so, again, people who are looking for companies that are like this, Mike, you need to start a group and find um, a a tribe of people who are doing all of this. But as we're talking about stories, you've had just an incredible journey, you know, all the way through crew, you know, through all of these businesses, ending with Simple Modern today. What is the one story of philanthropy that has really resonated and stayed with you that you might share with our with our listeners? Yeah, so, you know, I, I struggled with this answer because I, there have been so many great stories of how I've seen people's lives impacted. But if you're, if you're asking, like, what has the most dramatically impacted my life, then I think this is where, you know, the faith aspect of my life really comes in. Uh, and it's kind of impossible to answer it without, without talking about that. You know, I mentioned how I became a Christian in college. Well, really... There's people listening to this that are coming from, you know, obviously a ton of different perspectives uh, on that. So this isn't so much a commercial as it is me just kind of sharing my experience. But, you know, the Christian faith is basically built on this idea that we are in great need, that we have this really tremendous need or debt or, you know, whatever you want to call it, that we can't fix. And that when we're kind of helpless to fix it, which is exactly what, you know, every nonprofit is trying to help people that are in a situation similar to that. that while we're in this situation, that God responds. And that the way that he responds is with this just ridiculous generosity of offering the most valuable thing he has in his son. And that through that, we are made whole, that we are transformed, that are, you know, we're set free, however you want to say it. And so, that idea, that idea that if you really believe you have been a recipient of just outrageous generosity, how can that not transform the way that you think about being generous towards other people? The, the word that the Bible uses, grace, and it's kind of like in our culture, we use it you know, in a bunch of different ways that aren't really the way that the Bible uses it, but, but really grace is just this idea of undeserved favor, an undeserved gift. And, and I would just say this, we are mimics. We are mimetic. There's a lot of research on this. What we tend to do is we tend to repeat things that we have seen that we think are good. And, and you know, like it's even, even the words that we say and the way that we say things are really just this compilation of people that we've spent time around that we respect and that we've imitated. 
And so I, I would just make the point that the extent to which we feel like others have been generous to us and have shown us generosity proportionally impacts our ability to be generous to others. If you feel like you've been the recipient of generosity in your life, it becomes so much easier to be open-handed with everything that you have, right? And in the same way, if you don't feel like you've really been the recipient of generosity, it really can breed entitlement and, and the inverse of that. So for me, that's, that's the thing, you know, it's not a thing a particular, you know, person, human has done, it's more the attitude that I feel like God has displayed towards me kind of creates the foundation for how I think about the world and how I think about, you know, ownership of things. And that's why I'm a, I feel like I'm able to be a lot more open-handed with things because of that experience that goes all the way back to, uh, to college. Well, it's definitely evident in, you know, all the aspects of getting to hear your story today and Simple Modern's impact. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Mike, you know, from, if you've listened to our podcast, we always end all of our episodes asking for one good thing and brother, you've dealt out a lot of good things. So I don't know how you're going to narrow it, but what's something, you know, practical today, maybe an advice piece of tip so you could offer our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. I would say focus on multiplication. Hmm. Successful leadership is about developing and empowering other people. It's one of the most fundamental ways that we are able to be generous is by empowering others and by, by handing down the things that we've learned and that we've been taught that have been helpful to us. So one of the things that I've learned in the Simple Modern journey is why transitioning from the CEO of a startup, small organization to kind of the intermediate sized organization is so challenging. If you think about the earliest days of a startup, um, it's all about bias to action, making something happen. The leader is the first one through the wall at the front lines of the battle, you know, and really has to be getting their hands dirty. And often like the, the initial traction and success of the organization is a result of how gifted an executor, the leader, you know, the founders or the leader is in, in areas of the business. So, that leads to traction and the organization starts to grow. But as the organization grows, this crazy inversion happens, right? Where if you keep doing what you did to initially get the company off the ground, to initially get traction and success, all of a sudden, it will start to work against you. All of a sudden, it will start to rob other people in your organization the opportunity to lead and to grow and, and the platforms and opportunities that they're, they really desire and that they need in order to thrive. So people need, they need coaching, they need encouragement, they need vision, they need development. Um, and there's still all these aspects of our company where I might be the most qualified or experienced to do the execution, right? Mm -hmm. But if I do that, then I rob other people of that opportunity and context. So I have to make this intentional decision to step back and create space for other people to step into and, and to grow. So yeah, we may do things at a lower level than if I personally did it. But in the long run, we're so much stronger and so many more people are developed. So one of the ways that uh, I think about my job really is my job is creating scope for other people to grow. And that is actually far more stressful and difficult at times than the, the, you know, the selling of, of drinkware. That's, at this point, I feel like that, that has become more, uh, I don't wanna say easy, but I just feel more comfortable doing that. But the idea of I'm constantly trying to kind of stay out in front of my team and make sure that there's a frontier for them to develop and to, and to explore that that's, that's kind of my role. And uh, it's been exciting. It's been exciting as I, the more that I let go of things, the more that I see other people grow. The, the inverse is true as well. The, the tighter you hold on to things, the less people will develop and the more it becomes the self-fulfilling prophecy that you can't let go of things. If I let go of things, everything would fall apart. And a lot of leaders get sucked into that trap. So that would be my, my number one uh, piece of advice is that wherever you are in your organization's growth, are you pouring into and multiplying 
the next generation of leaders. You know, Becky, you mentioned, uh, I'd love it if there was a consortium of companies like Simple Modern. Part of the vision I have of how we hopefully are generous is that there will be people that are destined to be CEOs of companies that are, that are currently in our organization. And my hope is that some people continue to grow in the organization and will probably start other companies, but there will be others who the call will be to leave the organization. And I hope they do go and plant companies and they do take the culture and the distinctives and certainly they'll have their own perspectives. It won't be you know, a carbon copy of what we've created at Simple Modern, but they'll be able to take the things that they've learned and they'll be able to take healthy culture and generous mindset and create something new. And you know, that's what healthy organization, organizations and healthy things do. They grow and they multiply. Uh, and, and it's a good litmus test for us as a leader, not how, how big is our organization, how many people does it have in it, you know, what is its total fundraising, what is its sales, but rather how many leaders are you developing? You know, how much are you multiplying? Uh, how much growth are people experiencing? It, this, is, this is just such a wholesome conversation that gives me such hope because we're, we're, we're not in the most hopeful of seasons in our life right now. But I hear what you're saying. I see what you've already done. I feel like the runway for you is as long as you want it to be. And it really does give me hope that even just this generation that is, that is right now our front line in our companies, we are planting seeds that are gonna germinate something incredibly meaningful, you know, in the future. And I think even anyone who's listening to this and trying to get something out of it, I mean, this is, if Simple Modern is the gold standard of corporate responsibility, everybody should be pouring into these ideals. I mean, Julie pulled some fantastic stats here. You know, if you don't, if you don't think it's important, listen to these. 50% of millennials say that they would take a pay cut to find work that matches their values right now. That is a staggering stat. Employees who have a chance to give to charities through their workplace are much happier than those who do not. That's the Harvard Business Review. Half of employees believe their employer should connect them with opportunities for charitable engagement. Okay, so there was three quick ones that are from reputable science-based surveys telling you that your employees want to be connected to purpose. They want to be connected to things that uh, align and their values align. And, and of course they do, because it makes us feel good. Giving makes us feel good. Serving others, being a light to someone makes us feel good. I just love so much the simple modern story. And I have to tell you, just from a selfish standpoint, I am so, I'm just feeling like, feeling blessed in this moment for my for the community, for our community, for the world, to meet my friend Mike, who has been a humble leader since, you know, I've known him since we were seven. We were very, you know, I involved in student council. We were big student council dorks in high school. <laughs> and it's like, he has lived this his whole life. And to see, my friend, that you are infusing that into this company for good and going out into the world, it's just, it's just a wonderful thing. So, Tell our listeners, how can they connect with you? How can they connect with Simple Modern? Sure, certainly we'll include some of the links to some of these uh, videos that we've talked about in the show notes. Please come check that, that out on our website. Um, where are you on social? Yeah, so I've, I've decided to, to start investing some time in social. You can uh, catch me on Twitter at uh, Mike Beckham OU is my handle. Uh, I also, you can catch me on LinkedIn. Uh, and I started a blog, MikeBeckhamBlog.com. Uh, for the company, you can you can find us as I mentioned, and on Amazon, Target, Sam's Club. Uh, but the best place to go and, and learn about our our company uh, and and to shop our products is our website, which is just SimpleModern.com. And I would give a little plug to come follow Mike on LinkedIn um, because he is posting some incredible articles from his blog about leadership, entrepreneurship, basically being a good human as well, <laughs> threaded throughout all of that. Well, this has been awesome, Mike. Thank you so much for sharing your story and giving us such a great vision today. We are rooting for Simple Modern. We are rooting for you. Thank you, guys. Great being with you.